The first story in the Bible, the creation story of Genesis 1, is a story of hospitality. Like a gracious host preparing the house for dinner guests, God creates order out of chaos so as to create habitable, hospitable spaces where the creatures he delights in can live and thrive. In order to make a guest feel comfortable, a dinner host will sweep aside mess, put stray toys, clothes and books away they belong, and set things in order to create a pleasant, hospitable space in which a guest will feel at home. In Genesis 1, we see God acting in just this way, creating open, hospitable spaces where there once was chaotic mess, and then filling those spaces with the creatures who will inhabit them. Of course, unlike the dinner host, God doesn't simply order the spaces, God creates them. And God does not merely invite the guests, God creates all the beings which will find their home in those spaces. There are clear parallels between the first three days of creation, days one, two, and three, and the second three days, days four, five, and six. On days one to three, God creates hospitable, habitable spaces. On days four to six, God creates and places the creatures into those spaces, blessing them and giving them their creaturely tasks. In the beginning, we're told, there is nothing but formlessness and void, a watery chaos over which God's spirit moves. The Hebrew expression for this watery chaos, tohu wabohu, poetically describes this state of jumbled up formless chaos. In English, we might say that everything is topsy-turvy or higgledy-piggledy. It's like my house before a dinner party. It's not a habitable, hospitable space. Nobody and nothing can live and thrive here. It's not fit for guests. But God is a gracious host and sets about bringing order and creating those hospitable spaces. On the first day, God dispels the undifferentiated darkness which covers the face of the deep. This dark and this cold is the antithesis of hospitality. So God creates light and then separates the light from the darkness to create this habitable space, these habitable spaces called day and night. In parallel with this, on the fourth day, God creates the creatures who will inhabit the spaces called day and night. The lights of the dome of the sky which separate the day from the night and give light upon the earth. He creates a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night and a host of other lights, the stars. As well as placing them in this hospitable, habitable space, perfectly suited for them, God gives these lights their creaturely task, to be for signs and for seasons and to mark off periods of time, days and years. These lights have a job to do within the wider creation. They are intimately, intricately connected with all other creatures. They don't shine alone and aloof in their homes of day and night. On the second day, God turns to the watery chaos which lies all around. In order to make a hospitable, habitable space here, God sweeps aside the water, separating the waters above and the waters below with a dome called sky. In parallel with this, on the fifth day, God creates the creatures who will roam across the sky and swim through the deep waters, birds and sea creatures. God sees that they're good, and like the generous host that God is, God blesses them to thrive and flourish in the spaces that have been created for them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply upon the earth. On the third day, God sees that there's still too much water everywhere. It's all fine if you're a fish or a bird, but where will any creature that can't swim or fly find a place to stand? So God mops up the water, piling it in one place, separating the dry land called earth from the gathered waters called sea. As a gracious host setting the table, God calls forth all the plants and vegetation on the dry land which will give food and shelter to the creatures soon to come. And then on the sixth day, in the last parallel of the creation story, God creates the creatures who will inhabit this newly created land. The description of these creatures is extravagant, emphasizing their variety and their abundance. God creates wild animals of the earth of every kind, cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. And on the same day, God creates another animal of the earth, human beings, in God's own image. Just as a statue erected by a king in the ancient Near East would bear the image of the king and symbolize the king's rule, human beings, women and men alike, bear the image of God, representing God's gracious and hospitable rule in the world God has made and which God loves to death and beyond. Genesis 1.26 says that to be God's image bearers in the world God has made is to have dominion over all other creatures. Yet it would be a terrible misreading of the text to think that having dominion means doing whatever we want. Our dominion as image bearers is to model itself on Jesus, the only full, true, untarnished image bearer of God. Jesus' dominion doesn't look like exploitation or abuse. It looks like self-giving love, self-sacrificing service for those under his care. So Genesis 1 is clearly a story of hospitality, of making room for creatures to take their place, to live well in the world God has made for all of us. 
where the sun, moon and stars, birds of the air, creatures of the sea, or the multitude of wild and domesticated animals of the earth, all creatures find their place in the habitable, hospitable, generous spaces God has created and enter into relationship with God and with all of the rest of creation. So what do we make of this? Is it nothing more than an interesting way of reading the first chapter of Genesis? I'm convinced it's more than that. As we come to understand that God is a generous host and creation is an act of hospitality, a creation of a web of relationships that are intended for the well-being and flourishing of all creatures, I believe we're called to recover the same sense of ecological hospitality, to see ourselves as connected with all other creatures in the habitable spaces we share. We worship and we serve a hospitable God. Christians of all people know this. In Christ, God has thrown his arms wide open to welcome us, making room for us to come close to him. We see too that in creation, God is a hospitable God who makes room for us and for all creatures to live and to thrive, to be welcome in the world in relationship with all other creatures, and to flourish with God's blessing. Yet at the start of the 21st century, human beings are actively making the world less hospitable for so many of God's creatures. In the four decades from 1970 until 2012, the number of vertebrate animals on the earth was reduced by around 60%. Human beings were the prime driver of these extinctions, destroying habitats, polluting environments, hunting creatures directly. Where God makes room for all creatures to live and to thrive, human beings are now closing off these spaces, emptying of their abundance and their beautiful and necessary web of created relationships. Climate change may be the most striking and challenging way in which we're failing to live up to our created mandate to be hospitable, to have the same gentle dominion over creation which Christ has over his world. Human extraction and use of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas has pushed the level of greenhouse gases in our shared sky higher now than at any point in human history. These powerful heat-trapping gases have warmed the earth more than one degree compared to pre-industrial times. This increased heat and the disruption it causes to the earth's climate has terrible consequences for all creatures, particularly for the poorest and most vulnerable communities. In 2015 alone, which was the hottest year on record, until that record was shattered by 2016's record-breaking heat, Heat waves in India and Pakistan resulted in more than 3,000 deaths. Droughts across the Pacific, from South America through the Pacific to Africa, affected at least 20 million people, causing food insecurity and hunger, which is still devastating communities today. Cyclone Pan, likely the strongest cyclone ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere, smashed into the tiny Pacific island nation of Vanuatu, with wind speeds of over 300 kilometres an hour, making 75,000 people homeless and destroying up to 90% of Vanuatu's food crops. Those who have done least to cause the problem of climate change are those who are the most exposed to the impacts of global warming and who have the fewest resources to adapt to its impacts. In light of this, it's more urgent now than ever that we recover the idea of ecological hospitality. As God's image bearers, we need to share the same hospitable desire to ensure that all creatures have room to live and to thrive. We need to act accordingly. If our actions are causing harm to creation and hardship for our poorest brothers and sisters around the world affected by climate change, then we need to remember and we need to act on Paul's words in Romans 13. Love does no harm to a neighbour. We need to work to reduce our ecological footprint, to stand up for threatened and endangered species and to respond to climate change. In doing this, we live up to our created mandate to represent the generous and hospitable rule of God. We live in the love of Christ who gave himself up for us, and we offer a sign of hope to a desperate world that God has not abandoned us, nor sentenced the world to destruction, but waits and longs and will act to renew all things.